standing here with Reese from Lindsay, and his question is for Matt Sundin. Uh, you're my favorite player, and uh, I that was a good question. <laughs> oh, we're getting prompted. Okay, good, good going, Lauren. Um, and do you have any advice for me to make it into the NHL? Do I have a what? Advice for him uh, yes. to get in the NHL. He might want to grow because he's about three foot five now. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a young guy. He should be fine. Well, it's, it's a good question, and it's a question I think that we all get asked a lot. How are we, as, as uh, kids, going to do the, the most out of our chance to get to the National Hockey League? And I keep saying the most important thing is to go out and have fun and keep playing hockey if you love that. But also, you need to do everything else that you enjoy to do as a, as a kid. And when you're 15, 16, if, you're, if you still have the love for the game, you can maybe start focusing on just playing one sport, and if it's hockey in this case. So just have fun and go out and play, and that's going to develop you and, and keep building your passion for the great game of hockey. And if, if you're still there when you're 15, you can push hard and, and really start training hard to get to the National Hockey League. So, and keep dreaming. That's the most important thing, too. Enjoy it. I want to ask Boria a question because when Jerry McNamara went over to Sweden, he was actually looking at Inga Hammerstrom coming over here. And of course, then this gangly big defenseman was parading around the ice, making fools of everybody, and decided that maybe they better bring Boria along as well. That was the day and age of the Broad Street bullies, and, uh, and the game was played at a rather strange pace and with a lot of different things going on. And I'm, I'm going to ask you first, Boria, about that. And I'm going to ask Daryl, uh, because he was there with you, and how you reacted and how you were able to overcome an awful lot of things, because you weren't the one that was going to drop the gloves, but you certainly didn't back down from anybody. Well, I mean, uh, back home, we, uh, you couldn't drop the gloves, and <clears throat> you'd be suspended. So uh, coming over here, you know, you were not used to be fighting. So, But I remember in the, in the training camp, we... Uh, some of the guys, I don't know if it was there or not, but they sort of teach us to hold on and uh, how to fight and everything, but that was not really a good experience because when, they had the, when I had my first fight, was, uh, we played at home against Buffalo Saturday and the uh, second game was in Philadelphia. And uh, uh, somebody hit me in the corner uh, and uh, he shot me with a stick and I shot him back with a stick. We came up to the blue line and he dropped his gloves and I dropped his gloves. And, uh, I don't know if I was holding on for my life. I don't know. I can't remember really. But, but we came in and dressed him afterwards, and everybody said, great, great fight, boy, great fight, boy. And then somebody said, sitting inside, did you know who that was? No. I said, wow, that was the toughest fighter in the league, Dave Schultz. I said, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was, so I guess I did pretty good, I guess. Daryl, it, it, it was a situation that, uh, as, as it went on, your team ended up beefing up in order to counteract what was kind of going on in the league with teams like the Big Bad Bruins and with Philadelphia. Well, when Borja and Inge came over, they were the first two Swedish players, players, basically the first two European players, and obviously there was a whole different style of play in Europe compared to here. So, yeah, the North American guys, they tried to take deep, cheap shots at these guys to throw them off their game. And for me, as a teammate of Boreas, he was as tough as anybody. Didn't, you didn't have to drop the gloves, but he took abuse and he, and, and he, and he fought back. Ingi, on the other hand, was a little bit more intimidated. He, uh, you know, they would sucker punch him and he was a little more shy going into the corners, but Boria fought his way through it. But the other thing, like you said, we had guys like Tiger Williams, Pat Boutet, Jerry Butler, and our organization was smart enough to realize that we had to surround our key talented players with um, you know, tough guys. I fought not because I liked fighting, it was because I felt I had to. I was a target, as was Landy and some of these other guys. Nowadays, obviously, the game's changed a lot. There's no Downey Brook brawls. There's a one-on-one -on -one fight, generally just the tough guys. So it's changed a lot. But for me, Boria was, and I, and I respect teams now. Like, I look at the Detroit Red Wings uh, when they won the Cup the last few years. They didn't have a tough, physical uh, fighting type team, and Tim, but they, their players go into the corners hard, they come out with the puck, you know, they're there, they're not afraid, they're, their game isn't thrown off, and that's what we had in, in a guy like Boria. And to me, uh, I'm glad the NHL has cleaned up the Downey Brook brawls and the fighting and that intimidation part of it. It makes for a better game, and it gives everybody a chance to show their skills. 
Sam, you have a question up there? To my right, Dan and Sabian have a multi-part question for Johnny Bauer. Starting off with Johnny, when are you going to make that ultimate comeback? And Sabian, you go ahead. <laughs> um, how I wish did I you could feel answer. when you got hit in the mask? How did he feel when he got hit in the mask? Yeah. He wasn't wearing one. <laughs> Johnny, are, when, when's the comeback? Well, I love to come back now, particularly with the salary. I'll tell you one thing, if I got a million dollars, <laughs> I would retire in the next year. But uh, uh, no, it's, it's just great. I like watching them on television now, and my times are over, and uh, I had some great players in front of me, as Boyan, Dick, at Sit, and the rest of the guys, and, uh, and things are really, really, really happy for me. And uh, I, can't, I just can't say enough about Toronto, like, you know, I didn't want to come here at first, but uh, as the year went by, my dream came true, and uh, it was a great thrill. You know, one of, the, one of the, I think if you had a mask and the goalie equipment you have that they play with now, you probably would still be playing, I'd John. still be playing, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And making a hell of a lot more money than you did back then. Lots more. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren? I'm over here with Toronto's biggest fan, Sam, and he has a question for Daryl. So for Daryl and for Boria, uh, my question is whether or not you have any regrets about dealing with Harold Ballarder and that whole Ballard area with the Leafs. Well, I, I'm sure Daryl has, but I, let's hear from Boria first. The, 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 uh, working for Harold Ballard, what was yep. it like? Uh, <clears throat> working for Harold Ballard was, uh, well, he was really crazy sometimes, but, um, but I mean, that when you used to know him, you know, he was, he was a really kind guy. I mean, I used to stay, stay after practice, so it was, it was late, and uh, he came down and we were shooting about, we were talking about families, everybody, and uh, when you used to know him, he was a really, really nice man. But, I mean, he had some crazy ideas sometimes, and uh, it was, uh, that happened a lot, believe me, you know, after practice and everything. And uh, I remember once when uh, he came down after a practice, I don't know if we'd done bad or somebody had been writing something bad. He came in the dressing room, and we had sort of 10 uh, newspaper guys there. He came in and said, get out of here, you guys. So he kicked everybody out, and then he came in. I said, oh, my God, what happened there? I said, and then he came in and we asked him, what happened? What? Oh, nothing. I just want to get, it, get those suckers out of here. He <laughs> <laughs> was, was, like, was crazy. You know, never knew what was going to happen. Daryl? Well, I didn't have, my issues weren't with Harold, although he was a controversial, colorful guy, got the headlines of the papers lots of times. That caused some aggravation for us. You know, when, he, when Inge Hammerstein was here and he talked about him going in the corner with a dozen eggs and coming out with, you know, all, all of them broken or not broken or whatever it was. But, but my issues came, and, and when I say this, I have a lot of respect for Punch Imlach winning the Cups in the 40s and 50s. But when he came on the second time as general manager, I was in a position where I had a no-trade contract. I was the vice president of the Players Association. I was popular with my teammates and, and, uh, and with the fans. And the first thing he did when he came to Toronto, he wanted to challenge me on a lot of different issues, things that in principle, it was important for me as a, as a representative of the Players' Union and as a captain to stand up for. And when I did that, it created a lot of off-ice havoc, you know, with the media and with him. And, and that's where my challenge was. As far as Harold goes, I mean, I'll remember when I scored the overtime goal in the Canada Cup in 76. He had the receptionist at Maple Leaf Gardens answer the phone for the next couple of days, the home of Daryl Sittler. I mean, that was very kind of him to do that. That was a great honor. When I, uh, when I scored the 10-point game, he had my family uh, to center ice, gave us a beautiful uh, silver tea service set. So there were lots of good things, like Borea says, that Harold Ballard had a kind heart. I think he got in a tough situation because of Punch Imlach's mentality. It was like Punch wanted to run his team like he was a mili military general or sergeant back in the 40s and 50s and wanted to challenge us all and everything. And Harold had to back him up because he hired him, but th th that was my, my issue more with uh, Punch than... And unfortunately, when I say this as Leaf fans, those that are old enough to remember, that team in the 70s, when we knocked the Islanders out, if you look at the character of the players on that, guys like Lanny and Tiger and, you know, Boria and all, Punch Imlac traded 11 guys in a period of a few months off that team, and it took the Leafs a long time to recover from those trades and deals. And, you know, I don't blame that on Harold. I blame that on, on Punch. But uh, 
Certainly in the, in the 90s when Mats was here, Dougie Gilmore, Wendell, we had another great competitive team. Uh, and obviously we're trying to do that now with our new management team and, and try to be patient and build through the draft and get some key players here. So. You know, on uh, the 10 point night, um, I was there for that game. I've, I told you many times about this. I uh, had come down from Sudbury with a, a group from International Nickel and a motorhome. And our pregame warm up <clears throat> was fairly excessive. So I was in the building for 10 points, but I think I missed six of them. It wasn't until the next morning that we picked up the papers and said, hey, Siddler had a hell of a night last night. <laughs> Holy smokes. All right, um, Lauren or Sam? Sam, sorry. So I've made friends with Lauren here, who was a goalie for 11 years prior. So I think we have an idea about who he wants to ask his question. So go ahead and ask Johnny. Yeah, Johnny, um, out of your uh, Stanley Cup wins, which was your favorite Stanley Cup that you hoisted? Favorite Stanley Cup win, John? My the... first one, actually. Uh, I was always a dream came true. I always wanted to have my name engraved in Stanley Cup. And that's the first one that stands in my mind. And, of course, the last one, too. You know, I was... Holy Mackinac comes from my dad. And I would sit on my dad's lap watching John Bauer play, and whenever Johnny made a great save, my dad would exclaim, Holy Mackinac, what a great save. <laughs> I never got to ask my dad where it came from. He passed away before I went to high school, and I didn't start using that until uh, well into uh, my tenure here in Toronto. But the game that you played in Chicago, and you did the splits and pulled your groin, and then some guy named Don Simmons was coming into the game Johnny to play Simmons. goal for my Toronto Maple Leafs when my idol was going to the bench, I was crying because it was over. But tell the story about how you had to go to the bench and why you weren't going to go. Well, actually, uh, Captain George Armstrong come up to me. He says, uh, punch doesn't look like you're moving in the net. You're moving slow. I did the splits on the shot. By, uh, I just forget who Bobby Hall, I think it was. And uh, I says, uh, he wants you to come to the bench. I says, I'm not going to the bench. He says, you got to go to the bench. I'm not going. So he went down. <laughs> and told him that I wasn't going. George came back again. Three times that happened, back and forth. So finally, he said to me, he says, if you don't come, he's going to fine you $100. I says, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I went. So I had to go and get off the bench and let Dippy, well, we called him Dippy. He was a good goalkeeper. There was nothing. John Simmons was oh, a yeah, good Dippy, goalkeeper, he absolutely. Really was. But he wasn't Johnny Bauer, I'm sorry. Well, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> 